Okay, seventh grade, uh, chapter 15, study guide questions. Got 13 questions, so be sure you watch this video before you take your final quiz tomorrow morning. Uh, number one, describe how the Muslim Caliphate lost control of Spain. So basically three steps, three things happened that caused the Caliphate to lose control of Spain. Number one, Cordoba had a big civil war. Uh, and so this split the Caliphate into different competing groups. And so basically instead of having one massive kingdom of Cordoba, there were several small competing kingdoms. This made them very vulnerable. Number two, uh, Portugal split off from the rest of Spain and Portugal uh, was Christian, not Muslim. Right? So what used to be pretty expansive uh, caliphate territory was dramatically shrinking, especially when Portugal broke away. Uh, number three, the uh, Christians of Spain united. So there are basically two phases to this. Number one, northern Spain, which had always been occupied by uh, Christian kingdoms, united together. And as the Crusades were flowing through Europe, uh, there's a spirit of the Crusades that entered into Spain. So these Christian military forces had a lot of incentive to try to recapture Spain piece by piece. And then the second phase is the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, which uh, was what finally allowed Spain to establish itself as a Catholic country and uh, drive the caliphate out of its last stronghold, which was Granada. All right, number two. Even though the Crusades failed, how did the Crusades benefit Europe? So basically, the Crusades opened up the Mediterranean as a major trade and uh, culture hub. So uh, Europeans were exposed to uh, the mathematical, medical, scientific, astronomical achievements of other civilizations and cultures. Uh, they benefited tremendously from trade with those cultures, especially when it came to acquiring spices, which allowed them to preserve meat. Um, and then finally, uh, the Crusades inspired exploration in Europe. Right? It opened up Europe's eyes to the existence of other places in the world and the potential benefits of going there. Right? So because of the Crusades, uh, sailing across the Atlantic became more of a realistic possibility. Right? And so in 1492, Christopher Columbus does this. Probably would not have happened when it did if the Crusades didn't happen. Number three, why did William the Conqueror believe he had a claim to the throne of England? because he was related to his predecessor, Edward II, as a Norman. Uh, and he claimed that Edward promised the throne to him, not to Harold Godwin. How did the Norman conquest change England? Well, it introduced uh, the French language into the Anglo-Saxon dialect. And when Anglo-Saxon mixed with mixed uh, with the French language of the time, it produced English. Another change is that it uh, feudalized England. Harold Godwin had his nobles set up uh, kind of like a vast upper class. He didn't really have a strong feudal system, um, but because all of these Anglo-Saxon nobles were killed in the Battle of Hastings, there's all this land and territory and property up for grabs. William the Conqueror divvied that up among a much smaller group of nobles, which made the small group of nobles extremely powerful. And of course, um, for reasons we've already learned, Europe is particularly suited to feudalism. Number four, why did Pope Gregory the Ninth create the Inquisition? Uh, to deal with heresy. Right? He was very worried about rogue priests and bishops, rogue clergy, who were teaching things contrary to the magisterium at the time. Um, and so he created the Inquisition to try to root them out and stop it. He also used the Inquisition against uh, Muslims and Jews right, as a tool of persecution. Um, 
remember the Inquisition wasn't all death and torture though, right? There's he had good reasons for doing what he did. So I don't want to make it seem like Pope Gregory the Ninth was a bad guy just because he created the Inquisition. Right? He, he did have good intentions for it as well. Number five. What disagreement did Charlemagne and Pope Leo III have with one another? Who was in charge? Right? They got along really well, so they never fought over this. Charlemagne thought, because Pope Leo III put the crown on my head, that means I wear the crown, that means I'm in charge. Pope Leo III thought, well, I was the one who placed the crown on his head, so that authority comes from me, and it goes to him, so he works for me. Number seven. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Uh, number six. What did the nobles demand? Why did the nobles demand King John sign Magna Carta? Why did King John agree to do this? So they didn't like King John because he was really terrible when it came to winning battles. He lost several major battles in Normandy in a row. So basically he thought, the nobles thought King John was flushing away their money on these wasted battles, right? They thought, we don't mind paying taxes for battles that we win, but because we're never going to win, we don't want to flush our money away just to feed King John's ego. King John agreed to sign Magna Carta even though he didn't want to because the nobles and the church basically threatened to uproot him, to rebel. They gave him an ultimatum. Sign this document that limits your power or you're going to have a mutiny on your hands. And the Catholic Church might, I don't know, excommunicate you or something like that. So he's basically forced to. Number seven, in what ways did Magna Carta reduce the power of the monarch? Even though Magna Carta was created to benefit nobles, how did it help peasants and serfs as well? So Magna Carta reduced the power of the monarch by shifting power away from the throne to the Council of Nobles. So for example, uh, Council of Nobles was established as a legislative body. The monarch was not allowed to just impose taxes willy-nilly anymore. He had to get the approval of the Council of Nobles. Uh, it helped peasants and serfs as well, though. Why is this? Because of rights like habeas corpus. Um, it said that the king had to follow the law, right? So the king had to obey his own rules. Right? The king had to obey laws that were passed by the Council of Nobles as well. This is a really big deal. Number eight. How were Jews treated during the time of the Crusades? Um, depends where they were. Right? If they were in Europe or on the road to Constantinople or Jerusalem, pretty terribly. Um, roaming tribes of uh, rogue knights, uh, Christian mobs would brutalize Jewish towns, so much so that about 2,000 Jewish families committed suicide to avoid this. Uh, but in places like Jerusalem and Constantinople, uh, the Jews were liberated because they were being persecuted even worse by the Seljuk Turks. So they were treated pretty well uh, by the Crusaders in Jerusalem and Constantinople because they were seen as on their side. Uh, but yeah, pretty terribly everywhere else. So remember, uh, in Europe, in places like Spain, England, France, the Jews are banished. They're kicked out. They gotta pick up their stuff and leave. All right, number nine. How did the coronation of Charlemagne strengthen the power of the Roman Catholic Church? Um, Charlemagne acquired his power by basically uniting himself with the Pope, Pope Leo III. He said uh, that he was going to use his political power to promote monasteries, convents, churches, cathedrals. He was going to work hand in hand with the Catholic Church. And that's exactly what happened. Right? So Charlemagne was a very powerful promoter of Catholicism in Europe. What effect did this have on the Byzantine Church? Remember, the Byzantines were not happy that Charlemagne was crowned Holy Roman Emperor, right? The Byzantines already had an emperor, and they thought that Christendom only needed one emperor. They didn't see why the Western Church had a different emperor, so the Byzantines were not pleased. Number 10. 
Why was Cordoba a place of multicultural flourishing compared to the rest of Europe at the time? Uh, because at the time, Cordoba was under the control of the Umayyad Caliphate. The Umayyad Caliphate interpreted the Quran in a way that minimized uh, warfare and bloodshed and promoted economic growth. So there was a lot of, um, there were like libraries that were built in Cordoba. There were uh, marketplaces where people were essentially free to do business regardless of their religious background. So this attracted a lot of scholars, merchants, traders, artisans from all over the world to Cordoba. Um, so yeah. Number 11, what caused the first crusade? What connection was made between the crusades and feudalism? How did the church encourage Europeans to go on crusade? So the first crusade was caused by a variety of factors, but the number one thing was um, the um, civil war between the Umayyad Caliphate and the Seljuk Turks that resulted in the Seljuk Turks ousting the Umayyad Caliphate in Jerusalem. The Seljuk Turks did not treat the Christians and Jews who lived there well at all. They were severely persecuted. Um, also, the Seljuk Turks threatened to destroy Constantinople. So the Christians in Jerusalem and Constantinople asked Pope Urban for help. So that's, that's what caused the First Crusade. Uh, connection between the Crusades and feudalism. All right, so this one's kind of an interesting question because you have to remember what feudalism is all about and how this relates to Christian belief. So remember in a feudal system, you swear fealty to a lord and you swear to defend that lord's land. In Christianity, who is your lord? God, Jesus, the Trinity. What is the lord's land? Well, the Holy Land, Jerusalem. Right? So it's a pretty easy argument to be made. If you're a Christian in Europe who's used to a feudalist system, it's really easy for you to connect the dots. right? And you would see yourself, if you're uh, as someone who has sworn fealty to God, right? and if God's land is under siege, then you would have a duty to defend that land. How did the church encourage Europeans to go on crusade? A variety of ways. Um, so powerful kings and nobles were encouraged to crusade uh, with all kinds of incentives, like grants of land, um, soldiers, property. But probably one of the more unique tools that was used to encourage people to go on crusade were the, uh, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, sorry, I'm blanking. Wow, this never happens. The indulgences, there we go. Um, so yes, the Pope Urban and a lot of the bishops offered indulgences to whoever would go on crusade. Right, and that's a really, really big motivator. Number 12, why were habeas corpus and the creation of parliament important steps in establishing rights and protections against the monarch? So to answer this question, you have to know what habeas corpus and parliament are. So habeas corpus, remember, is a writ uh, that a court will issue to a jailer or a sheriff or whoever is imprisoning someone that demands to know why that person has been arrested and what crime they've been charged with, how long they're going to be held in jail or prison before they go before a judge. Right? So habeas corpus provides a lot of protections to people who are accused of crimes. So essentially what it does is it limits the ability of powerful people in Europe to go after or punish uh, their enemies. Because it, basically, you can't arrest someone unless they've actually committed a crime. You have to wait for them to commit a crime to punish them. That's what habeas corpus does. What about parliament? Remember, parliament evolves out of the council of nobles. And like I already said, the council of nobles 
a legislative body, right? The king is not allowed to pass new tax laws unless the Council of Nobles approves it. Same goes for Parliament. Last question. Why did Pope Gregory VII excommunicate the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV? Why was excommunication a severe punishment? So Gregory VII excommunicated Henry IV because they'd been fighting for a long time, and Henry IV tried to have Gregory VII ousted. He marched on Rome. He brought a huge army to Rome, and Pope Gregory VII had to flee. Right? Now, Pope Gregory VII himself was very powerful and had a lot of very powerful allies. So after he fled, he was able to sort of regain his footing, retake Rome from Henry IV, and then to punish Henry IV, he excommunicated him. Why was excommunication such a big deal? Remember, Henry IV was really upset when he got excommunicated. In fact, he went to Gregory VII's home, and he waited outside barefoot in the snow for three whole days as penance for his sin. Right? So Henry IV really wanted to get the excommunication lifted. Why? Why is it so severe? Remember, medieval Europe, the entire continent, is uh, subject to the authority of the Pope. Right? And if the Pope excommunicates you, or if the bishop excommunicates you, this means you no longer have access to the sacraments, for example. Right? And when everyone in Europe is the same religion and has the same beliefs about the importance of the sacraments, being excommunicated is basically like being banished from society. Right? I mean, you can still operate your business, uh, but you have no access to uh, the church anymore. And that's a big deal. All right. That's it for your study guide questions. If you have any questions about either quiz you're taking tomorrow, let me know on Classroom or on Remind. Um, so remember, social studies is at 11, religion is at 9. See you tomorrow.